Take care of it. Okay, so our final bit of uh, theory for uh, evolution unit, our gen genetic unit, is on this idea of evolution. So we've been working our way through all the stuff about genes, and one of the most important things about genetics is that it allows, well, inheritance of, in, of traits through genetics is that it allows, in fact, for species to change in response to the environment and and obviously speciate, become new species, or just um, remain extant, existing. Now, there's sort of three important characters in this whole process. So there's, there's lots of others as well, but these three are sort of classic people to know about. On the top right-hand side there, you've got a bloke called Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And Lamarck is quite a... Um, clever scientist, and he came up with a, a theory that actually now has some legs. The idea that we acquire characteristics um, simply by making a change. And his, his big example was the, um, the giraffe. So giraffes stretch their neck to get an advantage over the other animals. They reach higher into the tree for leaves and things, and then they pass it on. Now, it doesn't quite work that way, of course, because um, that's a somatic cell change and not... Uh, changing the genes at all. But they have found some theory in, in recent times, some um, ideas that showed genes changing in response to the environment, which is interesting. So Lamarck had some basis of truth. Um, the bloke in the bottom right-hand corner is uh, Alfred Wallace, who's famous for the Wallace line, where Australian flora and fauna stops and Asian flora and fauna starts. And it's as unlikely, not in Australia, but actually through uh, Indonesia. Um, and Wallace had a very similar theory to Darwin. I was about to publish his theory when uh, Darwin's friend suggested maybe it's about time he put his theory out there. Because he had a book ready to publish for about, well, I think it been 30 years. He was very, very cautious about publishing it because he knew that he would um, get into a lot of trouble from a lot of people for saying what he thought. Nowhere in Darwin's book does he say that humans have evolved from chimpanzees, which actually isn't true anyway. We both evolved from another um, prior, uh, what we call, ancestor species. But of course, having written his, uh, his theory of evolution, people jumped that conclusion and he got well and attacked for it. But essentially he's saying that um, there are changes caused by the environment and as animals change and become more fit for their environment then they are able to pass on their genetics and to their offspring whereas those who aren't fit for the environment don't get to pass it on and uh, it sort of explains why we had such a diversity of life on the planet um, so time is one of the really big things and one of the things that held up evolutionary science for a long time was the fact that we thought the planet was quite young we now have a, an age of 4.6 billion years on the planet and life for about 3.8 billion of those years. So the time scales are now much more likely to support the idea of evolution. Um, so the evolution of new species is the outcome of change through time in the gene pool of that species uh, and change in the environment. So that the change in the gene pool offer better chances of um, survival. So the modern theory basically states that a population must reproduce. There needs to be an excess of potential offspring. There needs to be variation amongst the offspring, and one glance around a classroom will show that we're all quite different. Certain individuals are selected, generally because they're more fit for their environment. And over time, those individuals um, pass on their genes and adaptation occurs, so change occurs. Chance effects can determine the different allele frequencies, and we have these ideas of divergence and speciation occurring over time. We'll go into some of those details. If we get the slide to jump, oops, two slides at a time. Um, so this whole process needs variation, and those variations arise because of mutation, which we looked at in the last podcast, and via sexual reproduction, that ability to mix alleles from two parent types who bring different alleles with them and the next generation slightly change. Uh, this uh, little diagram here is of the species of finch 
found in the Galapagos Islands. And this is one of the first things that uh, Darwin saw that really got him thinking about what happens here. We now know that uh, all these 16 species arose from one common ancestor that was blown from the South American mainland to these islands, these volcanic islands off the coast of, um, of South America. And they rapidly changed and speciated to fit the various bits of the environment so they could um, avoid competition with each other. And quite quickly over a period of time, we've got really different head type things. So these small and larger heads, blunter and sharper beaks. And these animals are either ground dwelling or in the trees, or some of them live in cactus, some live on insects, others eat fruit. And all these changes have been seen here. And it's really got Darwin thinking. So the theory of evolution is based on the concept of natural selection. And so essentially natural selection says there is variation with respect to various traits in a population. Some traits are better suited to survival than others. Not all individuals will survive and reproduce. Those individuals that do survive and reproduce will have suitable traits to their environment. And over time, those suitable traits will slowly increase in the population. And this could lead to a complete new species, and often does. So here's the man, Mr. Darwin, Dr. Darwin. Yeah, he's PhD, I think he did. Um, modern theory of evolution states that all living organisms share a common origin dating back around the 4 billion year mark. And over that time, many species have become extinct, and others, of course, have appeared. And we've quite a bit of evidence for this. Fossils, of course, are the classic, and uh, we're all aware of fossils. But unfortunately, fossils are really hard to form. They can be trace element, trace fossils, cast fossils, amber, and even preserved body parts. But the process of fossilization is a really, really delicate one. And of course, dead bodies are quite quickly disturbed by animals foraging for them. So an organism needs to die and be buried really quickly in an area that can remain undisturbed. Oxygen needs to be excluded, so they need to be coated quite quickly with dirt. The hard parts of the organism will leach out, which leaves a cast, which is then filled in later by minerals from the sands that are falling on top of them. And the mould is buried in sediment and, and covered by repeated layers and remains undisturbed. And this is actually quite an unusual occurrence. So fossil beds are very exciting for those fossil finders. So you can see here um, an impression fossil. So often plants will leave a sort of a stain, if you like, of their leaf pattern. Um, and that rock shows a lovely fern type there. They can be cast, so here are hollow bones. And of course, they're not the actual bone at all, but they were a mould for other minerals to fill in where the bone had been. Um, you can be mummified. So there's a classic insect stuck in amber. And the idea of Jurassic Park, of course, comes from that. Uh, or we have these traces, this wonderful foot here, um, which would have been buried in mud, and the, the, the space it's made in the mud has filled up with rock over time. We've got this lovely footprint of that animal's um, uh, foot, three, three claws. How old are fossils? Well, yeah, actually, it's actually one of the ways we can do this is what we call stratigraphic dating. If we know the age of the rocks, then as we work our way from bottom to top, we're seeing things getting younger and younger. So clearly fossils found towards the bottom of that picture are going to be much older than fossils found towards the top of the picture, which sort of makes sense, doesn't it? So if we can age the rocks or the sediments, then we can age the fossils found in them. Um, we can also do a thing called absolute um, age, which we use uh, either carbon-14 or potassium argon uh, dating. There are some other forms as well. But carbon-14 is used for... Uh, reasonably young fossils, about 40,000 years old, um, and carbon-14 will decay to a thing called nitrogen. So we're looking at uh, chemicals on the elements on the uh, periodic table. Everything's, of course, uh, decaying and releasing radiation. We'll talk about that another day. Um, and for things that are older than 40,000 years, we tend to use potassium decaying to argon. And you look at the ratios of potassium to argon, the ratio of carbon-14 to nitrogen, to show you how long that thing's been in the ground and, and decaying. And it's at least that's a reasonably simple thing to do. Um, I suppose we need to think about the geologic time scale, and of course the Earth is believed to be about 4.6 million years old, a billion years old, excuse me, uh, 4,000. Um, 
and this is useful for evolution because it requires a really long period of time. And that diagram there showing is the um, where we find the plates. So plate tectonics is also very important to this. In fact, that uh, the continents are always on the move and, and shifting. And of course, we live in the middle of our plate, and so we don't get a lot of activity from volcanoes or earthquakes. But on the margin of our plate in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia and New Zealand, we do see a lot of activity. And of course, around that uh, Pacific Ring of Fire, you're seeing lots and lots of volcanic activity and, and um, constant uh, earthquake material uh, movement. Um, plate tectonics is the idea of how the whole planet, it's, it's plates of, uh, of rock or uh, sitting on top of molten rock. And because convection currents set up in that molten rock, we can see how this can move enormous amounts of, um, of land. Of course, that requires incredible heat, and we know that the core of our planet is very, very, very hot and keeps that rock molten and, and moving. And so on top, the plates move as well. And you can have uh, plates moving apart or plates colliding and creating all sorts of different features. Um, I might skip that for the time being. So biogeography combines both biology and geography to have a look at how, in fact, this does occur. And we can find all sorts of interesting fossils, which are proof of places like Gondwana. So once the part time Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, India, Madagascar, and New Zealand were all attached. And as they've moved apart, we've got these wonderful fossil finds that confirm that, that they were once collect, connected. And of course, uh, a lot of the remnants of that time live in Australia because they remained uh, isolated from the rest of the, of the Northern Hemisphere. So things like the Waratah, um, Galaxid, that little fish on the right-hand side, all these flightless birds, and on the left-hand side, the bottom is a lovely Nathophagus um, forest, which is a, a plant we find in southern Victoria, Tasmania, and the uh, fossil beds of Antarctica. All these trees are common, trees and animals are common across the, the Gondwanan um, uh, continents, or at least trapped in their fossils. I'm realising time's running out, so I'm going to have to move along a bit faster. Homologous structures, structures that have a similar um, shape, but have quite different functions. So in the human cat, wild and bat there, you can see our forelimbs. They're all used for locomotion, but they all shiver quite differently. In analogous structures, we see animals that have developed the wing, for instance, but in quite different ways. So their structures are quite different, but their, their purpose is the same. We've studied also a thing called comparative embryology. And you look at these and you see in that early stage, that first trimester, the fish, the amphibian, the turtle, the pig and the human aren't all that different. But by that late trimester, the third trimester, we're seeing quite clear differences. So all life began in the oceans and their embryos really show that connection is still there. You can see the gill marks and all of them. Um, we also have things called vesicle structures. And interestingly enough, whales have hip bones. They're no longer connected to the actual skeleton, but they're still there, and they don't perform any function anymore. So vestigial meaning no function. But it shows us how, in fact, whales were mammals that went back to sea. So probably more rather to cows than anything else. Um, we use all this information to create these things called phylogenetic trees, which show which ancestors have branched off where to create uh, different groups of living things. And um, now, of course, we can use DNA, and so we can get amino acid sequences, we can get the nucleotide sequences that created those amino acids, or um, and sequence all the DNA and compare the DNA to create quite detailed um, and comprehensive lists of similarities, which is why we can say that, you know, we're sort of 45% cabbage and we're, you know, 97 or 98% chimpanzee. We share our DNA sequences that closely. Um, to study DNA, we tend to take, obviously, nuclear DNA from our cells, but mitochondria and chloroplasts also have DNA, and these are quite interesting because they form clocks in that, in that their mutation rate is quite steady, unlike the mutation rate of nuclear DNA, and so they've been quite useful in some of these studies. Um, and, of course, we can collect human DNA from ancient fossils too. Not as easy, because uh, fossil, the DNA tends to uh, decay over time, but reasonably robust and uh, can be gained from some fossils. I'm about to run out of time, I know. Oh, 
perfect timing the last few seconds we're done